Welcome to Dermatology Explained. Today's video presentation is focusing on part three of our autoimmune bullous diseases video series, looking at, at a condition called pervigus foliaceus. First of all, let's recap what are the pervigus blistering disorders. Pervigus is characterized by intraepidermal split in the skin. Pervigus is derived from the Greek word pemphix, which means blister or bubble. It can be categorized into six groups, including pemphigus vulgaris, which was discussed in part two of this video series. Pemphigus vulgaris includes a variant form known as pemphigus vegetans. There's pemphigus foliaceus, which is today's topic. Variants include an endemic form called folo salvagum, as well as a lupus-like variant called pemphigus erythromatosus. There is also IgA pemphigus, drug-induced pemphigus, paraneoplastic pemphigus, and hepatoform pemphigus. This is a schematic to remind ourselves of the different molecular structures inside the human skin. We can see here that in the epidermis, when zoomed up, there are a number of component molecules which can act as targets in autoimmune blistering disorders. And this includes desmoglein 1 and 3, as well as some other targets such as desmocolin, pagoglobin, pagophyllin, and periplacon. In the basement membrane zone area, there are a different set of molecular targets such as BP230, BP180, laminin gamma, laminin 332, and type 7 collagen. And these are the target antigens in subepidermal autoimmune blistering disorders. In terms of pemphigus foliaceus, the target is typically desmoglein 1 which is a component of the desmosomes, which act to allow keratinocytes to bind together in the skin. Pemphigus foliaceus is an autoimmune blistering disorder. It is characterized by superficial blisters, erosions, and crusting on the skin. In Australia, it is less common than pemphigus vulgaris, which was discussed in part two of this video series. In some parts of the world, however, it is endemic and is more common. An endemic form of pemphigus foliaceus is found in rural parts of South America, especially in Brazil, as well as some areas of Africa, especially in rural Tunisia. It has a insidious onset with localized disease slowly extending. It can also be photosensitive as well. In terms of the pathophysiology of pemphigus foliaceus, it, it produces immunoglobulin type G autoantibodies, which target desmoglein 1 or DSG1. As already mentioned, DSG1 is found on keratinocytes towards the upper part of the epidermis, and their binding of the autoantibodies causes these keratinocytes to separate and be replaced by fluid in between, creating a blister on the superficial surface of the skin. The blister, because it is superficial, is fragile and susceptible to trauma, which means it can be easily broken apart when the top layer peels off. In an endemic form of pemphigus foliaceus, this is Fogo salvagum, and it's thought that there is a genetic susceptibility as well. So people who have HLA-DRB1, when they are bitten by specific certain strains of insects, their insect antigen can mimic DSG-1, which leads to the formation of autoantibodies, which then can attack DSG-1 in the skin, thereby creating blisters in the superficial surface layer. There are a number of also drug-induced associations with pemphigus foliaceus, and broadly, this is categorized into two groups. The first group of drugs have a sulfahydryl group, which can cross-react with DSG-1 or 3, and this includes captopril, penicillamine, penicillin, and peroxicam. The second group are the non-sulfahydryl drug groups, and this includes cephalosporins, TB drugs such as rifampicin, rifampitol, and isoniazide, isotretinoin, and cocaine. So these non-sulfahydryl groups medications can also be associated with pemphigus foliaceus as well. In terms of the clinical features, these cases present with scattered scaly lesions involving seven or areas typically, including the scalp, face, chest, and upper back. Blistering may not be obvious because small flaccid blisters will rupture easily, 
with minor trauma, which leaves behind the scale erosions and crusting. The scales separate, leaving well-demarcated crusting erosions surrounded by erythema. Sometimes there are small vesicles along the borders of these lesions as well. Erosions can be painful and offensive, and eventually the patient may become erythrodermic with crusted oozing red skin. Oral lesions are uncommon, and this is in contrast to pemphigus vulgaris. Here are a number of images which demonstrate the scaly, crusted, eroded lesions associated with pemphigus foliaceus, and we can see that they are typically over separate areas. Mucosal involvement is usually not present in pemphigus foliaceus. There is a variant known as pemphigus erythromatosis. This is a localized variant of pemphigus foliaceus with malar distribution of the lesions. However, few patients actually have concurrent pemphigus foliaceus and lupus. The variant that is endemic is called Fogo salvagum. It is most prevalent in rural areas of Brazil. It has also been reported in areas such as Tunisia, Peru, Paraguay, El Salvador, and Colombia. It affects children and young adults and is linked with poverty and malnutrition. There is a high incidence in areas near rivers and streams. And as already mentioned, individuals with genetic susceptibility with HLA DRB1 can have this form of pemphigus foliaceous when they are bitten by insects. When bitten by certain insects, the pathogenic IgG4 against DSG1 autoantigen has been shown to cross-react with a sal salivary antigen of the sandfly, suggesting molecular mimicry with antigens by sandflies and other insects, such as black fly as well. In terms of investigations, a biopsy can be considered. This demonstrates a histology that can be identical to pemphigus foliaceus, Fogo salvagum, and pemphigus erythromatosis. There is a split in the upper epidermis, which is known as acantholysis. It is often indistinguishable from impetigo and staph scolded skin syndrome, as in these conditions, there can also be autoantibodies produced against desmoglein proteins as well. Within the blister, there may be acantholytic cells, and in some cases, there may be eosinophilic spongiosis. There is also moderate dermal inflammatory infiltrate. Direct immunofluorescent studies will show IgG and C through staining throughout the epidermis. However, it is particularly prominent in the upper layers of the epidermis, as this is where desmoglein 1 is typically expressed. Here is a histological slide demonstrating acantholysis in the upper layer of the epidermis, which is characteristic of pemphigus foliaceus. The cleft occurs beneath the granular layer of the skin. There is also some acantholytic cells as well. This is the direct immunofluorescent study on a sample of pemphigus foliaceus. When the sera containing only anti-desmoglein-1 IgG, it will stain the cell surface throughout the epidermis. However, it will stain the superficial layers more prominently as DSG-1 is particularly expressed in the superficial layer of the epidermis. Other investigations include indirect immunofluorescence, which results are indistinguishable from pemphigus vulgaris. There is positivity in over 85% of cases, and titers typically correlate with the extent and activity of disease. An ELISA test can also detect anti-desmoglein antibodies in up to 70% of patients. In terms of management of pemphigus foliaceous, the initial step will be to explain the diagnosis. Pemphigus foliaceous may be due to genetic predisposition or a triggering factor such as infection or drugs. It involves the production of autoantibodies against a target antigen on the surface of the keratinocyte, which is usually desmoglein 1 or DSG1. Overall, it is a benign disease which responds well to treatment. However, it may remit and relapse. In rare instances, it may evolve into pemphigus vulgaris. In terms of treatment options, because pemphigus is caused by pathogenic autoantibodies, target therapy must be designed to reduce autoantibody production, not just suppress local inflammation. The initial step would be to use potent topical and possibly intralesional corticosteroids for localized lesions. 
Otherwise, systemic therapy with prednisone, 20 to 40 milligrams a day is the initial step. In terms of steroid sparing agents, rituximab is increasingly used as the preferred steroid sparing agent. It is a biologic which targets CD20 and thereby suppresses antibody production by B cells. Other traditional steroid sparing agents include azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, hydrochloroquine, as adjuncts to oral corticosteroids in severe cases. In more resistant cases of pemphigus foliaceus, IVIG may also be considered. There are also reports of use of dapsone as monotherapy or with oral corticosteroids, as well as mycophenolate mofetil as another option for pemphigus foliaceus. In terms of potential complications as a result of pemphigus foliaceus, even though it has a benign prognosis in most instances, it may be associated with infection, dispigmentation, longer-term scarring, alopecia, as well as some reports of squamous cell carcinoma in chronic and, in, and untreated skin areas affected by pemphigus foliaceus. Thank you for listening to our video presentation today on pemphigus foliaceus. I hope you've learned something interesting about this dermatological presentation, and we hope to see you at the next video.